This is probably the most notorious piece of German artillery from the Second World War. The 88 Flugabwehr Kanone, the 88mm flat gun. Originally, it was an anti-aircraft weapon, but the Germans found a second, even more deadly use for this high-velocity gun. Fire! The D-Day landings had been a success. The Allies had gained the foothold they needed in France. They now faced three major problems. Firstly, the German army was hugely experienced, had excellent equipment and knew the countryside intimately. Secondly, the Allies needed a port to supply and build up their armies. And thirdly, they needed to capture the key city of Caen. The battle for the beaches was over. The battle for Normandy had only just begun. Taking the historic city of Caen had been one of Monty's main objectives on D-Day, but the Allies had failed. Caen remained in German hands. Its importance lay in the fact that it controlled all the major roads in and out of Normandy. With the Germans dug in tight in Caen, the Allies looked for a back route into the city. The small town of villers bocage controlling the main road from the west into Caen, was an ideal target. Normandy, D-Day plus seven. British tanks and armoured vehicles thrust deep behind enemy lines in an attempt to secure the town. They were about to learn a bitter lesson. On the morning of 13th of June, forward units of the 22nd Armour Brigade came up that road and pulled up here, at the bottom of the hill in villers bocage Now, villers bocage runs up a hill, 20 miles in that direction, is Caen. This town is the back door to Caen. When the British arrived, the place seemed deserted, there was no one around, so the commanding officer took A squadron, tanks and other vehicles, up the hill to park up, have a look around. The tanks and armoured vehicles of B squadron remained at the bottom of the hill. Amongst them was Harold Curry, the 19-year-old wireless operator of a Cromwell tank. We came into Ville Bacage, no sign of any Germans. Mm. People came out on the streets, they threw flowers on the tank, gave a cider, and I thought, this is marvellous. Yeah. You know, I can live like this. As you would. <laughs> As Harold Curry and B Squadron waited at the bottom of the hill, the tanks of A Squadron were parked up at the top. What they didn't know is they'd actually been spotted by elements of the SS Panzer Division in the area. Now, the Germans had concentrated their best armour, the dreaded Tiger tank, a generation ahead of any Allied equipment, concentrated it together and put it under their best man, Eastern Front tank ace, Michael Wittmann. Wittmann had made his name against the Red Army in Russia, where he's said to have notched up 100 tank kills. By the time he was posted to Normandy in spring 1944, he was 30 years old and a national hero. Here in the centre of the town, hiding in a side street, Wittmann watched A Squadron go past. He let them go. Then, seizing his moment, he drove his tank out into the high street and barrelled down the hill, firing at anything he could lay his sights on. Tanks, half-tracks, armoured cars. It was chaos. All hell was let loose. And on the radio, I would hear that things were happening, there were explosions all over the town. Yeah. Uh, buildings being uh, knocked down. Unbelievable. As his tiger blasted its way down the high street, Wittmann left a trail of British destruction in his wake. At the bottom of the hill, B Squadron was reeling. They were taking terrible losses. Eventually, they pulled themselves together and started to return fire. Wittmann's Tiger took a hit from a Firefly, the only tank the Allies had capable of dealing with a Tiger. So, realising he was outnumbered and possibly outgunned, he turned tail and headed back up the high street, on his way collecting a couple of other Tigers to see what damage he could do at the top of the hill to A Squadron. Up here on the high ground, A Squadron was completely caught out. Wittmann had taken his Tigers across the fields over there and attacked from the side, just about here. 
he started dishing out the same sort of punishment he had down at the other end of town. 22nd Armour Brigade was in serious trouble. Having knocked out A Squadron, Wittmann's Tigers turned back towards the centre of town. But this time, the tanks of B Squadron were waiting for him. The men at the bottom of the hill had gathered themselves together, gone round the edge of the town and formed up here in the town square for an ambush. There were more buildings here, there was more cover. They waited for Wittmann, he came down the hill, he passed that building there and they let go with everything they'd got. Eventually, his Tiger was knocked out with a shot from a six-pounder anti-tank gun at the back of his tank, its only vulnerable spot. Although his tank was out of action, Wittmann managed to escape. One of the other Tigers in B Squadron sites wasn't so lucky. Once we saw the 88 millimeter of a Tiger tank appearing, we fired. Yeah. And they went through the side of the front of the tank, killed the co-driver and driver. Yeah. The tank then veered out of control down the street, and in my excitement as a young man of 19, I jumped out the turret, then round the corner. I saw hanging over the turret of the Tiger a belt and holster with a Luger pistol. <laughs> I grabbed it, ran yeah. back, and that yeah. was my memento. It's a souvenir. Uh, souvenir. Oh, extraordinary. <laughs> While Harold Curry was grabbing himself a Luger, Wittmann got himself another tank. Later that afternoon, German panzers returned in force to Villebocage, and British 22nd Armoured Brigade was forced to withdraw. The battle-hardened German army had slammed the back door to Caen shut, destroying about 50 British armoured vehicles in the process. But the Allies would be able to replace their lost equipment, thanks to an ingenious British invention. Down there is the tiny coastal town of Aramanche. It's Normandy seaside resort. But in 1944, it was slap bang in the middle of the Allied invasion. From those cliffs, 25 miles in that direction, is the American sector. The British and Canadian sectors stretch 25 miles in that direction. But Aramanche itself was to be the scene of what has to be one of the greatest feats of engineering of all time. After D-Day, the Allies desperately needed a port, but Cherbourg and Le Havre were still in German hands. Aramanche would be the location for a remarkable British experiment, to build an entire artificial harbour. This is one of the few places in Normandy where you get a sense of the sheer scale of what happened here in 1944, mainly because bits of it here are still for you to look at. On D-Day plus one, the day after D-Day, from all over the UK, parts of a giant artificial harbour started to be shipped over towards Normandy. An artificial harbour, something no one's done before or since, built in total secrecy, so secret in fact that the men working on it didn't even know what it was. Millions of tonnes of steel and concrete brought together to be assembled here in a sort of giant science fiction jigsaw, an artificial harbour, a port the size of Dover. What's visible here today are the remains of 73 prefabricated concrete blocks known as the Phoenix units. Up to 60 metres long and weighing up to 6,000 tonnes each, they were tugged over from England and flooded in situ. They formed what was codenamed Gooseberry, an outer breakwater to protect the harbour. Inside the breakwater were the docking points themselves, connected to the shore by floating pontoons known as whales. No one knew if it would work. Not only was it top secret, it was so enormous it had never been tested. You grow up when you come to things like this. Yeah. And we were kids when we landed and men within, what, a week? In June 1944, George Batts was an 18-year-old sapper with the Royal Engineers, assigned to Mulberry Harbour. And what was your and job actually on no, the no, on the Mulberry? My job actually was going out there, unloading the ships onto lorries. They'd come off, and I think I'm right in saying that the actual tonnage used to be up to 10,000 tonnes a day unloaded. I remember one time there was a problem up the front somewhere. Mm. And we had, uh, my unit had a cable from Montgomery asking for extra effort for ammunition. And we increased the next day by nearly 5,000 tonnes. And, um, you know, feel proud of it. Yeah. But at the time, you didn't feel so proud, you know, it was hard work, <laughs> let's face it. 
But just as supplies were starting to build up, the whole experiment came very close to disaster. On the 19th of June, D-Day plus 13, Mulberry was hit by the biggest summer storm in living memory. The second Mulberry Harbour in the American sector was severely damaged, but at Aramanche repairs started almost immediately. It was back in operation within a week. The Allies now used Mulberry to build up thousands of tons of supplies for the big frontal assault on Caen. But they still hoped to seize a natural harbour as well. In the west of Normandy, the Americans were racing to take the deep water port of Cherbourg. But the countryside they had to fight through to get there was a defender's dream, the dreaded Bocage hedgerows. Some of these hedgerows are over 2,000 years old, planted by Celtic farmers. Over the centuries, the roots have knotted together with the earth to form these banks. In some parts of Normandy, they're up to 10 feet high. The hedgerows themselves are very thick, full of brambles. Often there's a ditch the other side. They're virtually impenetrable. Now, imagine you're an Allied patrol advancing up one of these lanes. Suddenly, you come under fire. Now, you try to take cover, you lie down on the bank, but there is no cover. You try to get through the hedgerow, you can't. You go over to the other side, it's exactly the same thing. Now, this countryside was a nightmare for Allied soldiers to advance through. They grew to dread it. But for the Germans, it was ideal defensive territory and they made the very most of it. They'd dig machine guns into the banks, they'd have self-propelled guns hiding around corners that would pop out, fire at you, and then disappear before you even knew what had happened. War sucks. War sucks. You better believe it. 19-year-old Ed Manley was a private in the American 101st Airborne, the famous Screaming Eagles, who fought through the Bocage countryside. What we had to admire about these people was they had, on either side of the hedgerow, they had a foxhole, and they didn't have to come up. They went underground from one, one side to the other. They would take the dirt away and spread it around. When we do a foxhole, it's part of our yeah. emplacement. But with them, it's, uh, they spread it out, so you didn't know, you couldn't see, coming down a road, you couldn't see there was a hole there. So the Germans could be anywhere? And they could be either side of the hedgerow. God. You know, and it was, uh, it was a deterrent. That was, must have been pretty nerve-wracking. Yeah, because, well, because you, you can't get through the hedgerow, well, you can see this stuff. Yeah. It, it, it's so damn thick. If, if a, a machine comes through, a, a gun, any kind of a machine gun on a, on yeah. a set of wheels, you, you can't get away from it because you've got a little drainage ditch, and that's it because you can't get through the damn hedgerow. You know? So there were ambushes going on all the time. Yeah, and, and, right, right. And you're trying to basically attack through great defending country. Must right, have been... right. It's the easiest. The, the defender had the advantage, yeah. let me put it that way. After three weeks of bitter fighting, losing virtually a man for every yard of ground gained, the Americans finally reached Cherbourg. But it was all for nothing. The Germans had completely destroyed the harbour facilities. So the artificial Mulberry Harbour became a lifeline to build up all the supplies needed for the final big assault on Caen. Normandy, D-Day plus one month. The Allies had failed, with heavy losses, to take the city of Caen through the back door of villers bocage To drive the Germans out of Normandy now, the Allies would have to build up massive supplies of men and machines through the extraordinary artificial harbour at Aramanche. With an artificial port in place, even bitter setbacks like villers bocage could be overcome. With men and machines pouring into the beachhead, Montgomery felt he could make his final decisive move for Caen. Monty's first tactic was to destroy German resistance from the air. On the 8th of July, 1944, D-Day plus 32, he ordered Operation Charmwood. It was the first time heavy bombers had been used for carpet bombing the battlefield. For the French civilians caught underneath it, it was a horrific experience. You must remember that at the time, bombing was part of the strategy. And if we wanted to get rid of the Germans, there was no other way. 24-year-old student André Heinz was with the French resistance in Caen during the battle for the city. We were bombed 
20 times and four times with more than 300 bombers that bombed again the place that was uh, still burning. Mm. Uh, the, the fire spread and spread, and since there were no firemen left, left and no equipment, mm. the city burned for 11 days. Eventually, the resistance managed to alert the Allies not to target the old church, which was being used as a civilian hospital. No more bombs fell, yeah. uh, except a few shells, but uh, a few shells, uh, well, I think they were all, all the same, 200 uh, on, on the area, but that was nothing compared to 600,000 shells that were fired at Caen during the battle. Gosh. In the carpet bombing of Caen, 5,000 civilians had been killed and 17,000 wounded. But the Allies still didn't control the whole city. The Germans held vital strong ground to the south. Having failed to drive out the enemy from the air, Monty now ordered an even bigger push on the ground, Operation Goodwood. But on D-Day plus 41, the day before the operation was due to start, the Allies had a stroke of luck. 52-year-old Erwin Rommel, Monty's old rival from the desert and now in charge of German defences in Normandy, was visiting one of his badly hit tank divisions. The Allies had total control of the sky. Rommel had to travel on smaller roads to get around, but for a short stretch, they were forced to take a major road. Suddenly, Allied fighter planes appeared from the sky and strafed the road, hitting Rommel's car, blowing the driver's arm off, and the car careered off the road and crashed into a tree. Rommel suffered serious head injuries and was out of the picture. And with the Allies about to undertake a major offensive, Operation Goodwood, the Germans were at a serious disadvantage. Having failed to take Caen with air attacks, on the 18th of July 1944, D-Day plus 42, Monty launched Operation Goodwood, the big ground assault. It opened in classic Monty style with a massive bombardment of the German positions south of the city. A thousand Allied tanks would then charge forward in an attempt to dislodge the Germans once and for all. If the Allies were going to finally control Caen, then they had to take the vital high ground overlooking the city, the Borgibou Ridge. Battlefields don't necessarily announce themselves. Very often they're very ordinary places, and this really is a pretty ordinary place. It's not much to look at, there's some industrial estates, some pylons, but this is actually the scene of the most crucial battle for Normandy, Operation Goodwood. Over there we have Caen, the crossroads city that Montgomery planned to pivot his entire army invading into France around. North of there we have the beachheads. Now this countryside is very different from the Bocage. It's what they call perfect tank country. Wide open spaces, giant fields, room for enormous cavalry charges. And that's what Montgomery had in mind. With Operation Goodwood, he had assembled over there in the beachhead a thousand tanks, 75,000 men, ready to push on through the German lines. All they had to do was come up this hill and engage the Germans. But it's this hill that's the problem. It doesn't look like much, it's probably 30, 40 metres inclined to the bottom. But this hill to a defender is a gift, especially if you're the German army, familiar with the terrain, dug in with 200 tanks and the dreaded 88 millimetre anti-tank gun. The 88 was originally designed as an anti-aircraft gun. Its rate of fire was 15 rounds a minute. That's one round every four seconds. Its effective ceiling, the height at which it could hit aircraft, was 8,000 metres, five miles high. And its target-finding technology was way ahead of its time. A forward observation post would spot a target, then relay back to the gun the information about that target by means of a Funk Mesquerate, a simple analogue computer. That information would appear on these dials, speed, height, direction of the target. The crew would then match up the arrows on the dials to acquire the target with the gun. Having matched up the dials, the 10-man gun crew would then let the 88 rip at a velocity of a thousand meters a second, three and a half thousand miles an hour.
Apart from packing a heavy punch, the 88mm was a very flexible gun. It could fire straight up into the sky, traverse through 360 degrees, and also shoot three degrees below the horizontal. This meant that it was very effective against targets on the ground. Up on Borgibu Ridge, the man in charge of the German defences during Operation Goodwood was 33-year-old Major Hans von Luck. At the top of the hill, he found a battery of 88s pointing at the sky. He went up to the captain in charge, a Luftwaffe captain, and told him to lower his guns and start attacking the approaching tanks. The captain refused, saying his job was to shoot down aircraft. Von Luck drew his pistol and asked the captain which he'd prefer, to be shot or win a medal. The captain lowered his guns. Fire! The main thrust of Operation Goodwood was underway. A thousand Allied tanks charged up the hill towards Borgibu Ridge, taking heavy losses from the German Panzers and 88s. I came straight from a train regiment, and my attitude was, let's get at them. Les Dinning was an 18-year-old tank gunner with the British 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats. Although I came across this plane in 1944, this is the first time I've come back, and of course it's quite different to what it was then. Hmm. And this was an absolute dust bowl. It was perfect for the 7th Armoured Division because yeah. they had been fighting in North Africa. Yeah, in the desert. In the desert, and in many ways, it, it was perfect fighting ground. It may have been perfect tank country, but as the first wave of British armour advanced, the German 88s and Panzers opened up, leaving dozens of British tanks burnt out in the cornfields. You ask me, what did it feel like seeing these columns of black smoke ahead yeah. of us? If I said nothing, it felt, we felt nothing. Mm. I mean, it, it's a common sight. I mean, it, from the time that we landed on Gold Beach, yep. you're seeing columns of smoke, you're seeing bodies lying around. During the two days of Operation Goodwood, the Allies lost some 400 tanks and over 5,500 men. One of the prevailing things that I remember about Normandy was the smell. Yeah. The incredible smell of putrefaction. Um, not only animal, but human mm. as well. And it, it, it overrode everything, but you got used to it. Operation Goodwood had been a costly exercise, but in the city of Caen, the last of the Germans had finally been driven out. In the process, the medieval capital of Normandy had been virtually reduced to rubble. Caen was finally secured, though the city lay in ruins. The Allied plan was working, but was six weeks behind schedule. Now it was time for the next dramatic phase, the big push for Paris.